Hello everyone, I'm back with this paper, Fragments of Science. Correct what you can correct where I've gone wrong. But uh, let's go together, let's go through these questions together and see how we can work them out. I'm doing physics paper two, as you can see it's from November 2018, which is um, an internal paper. I'll do the first section only. Um, let's get to the questions. Okay, so for question one, uh, answer all questions, of course, from this section. And then question one reads, the figure below shows a measuring device. Okay, measuring device, the units are in millimeters, of course. The first question there is, uh, name the instrument, name the instrument. The name of the instrument is the micrometer screw gauge. Okay, that is a micrometer screw gauge, not fully drawn, but of course, you would come across it if you studied uh, your grade 10 physics book what is the reading on this uh, what is the reading shown <coughs> excuse me the reading shown uh, this is my main scale reading where this is my main scale okay this scale is simply divided in such a way that you can see from the scaling that this is 3 3.54 4.55 5.5 then 6 so we'll take it as 6.0 okay 6.0 because um, somehow the half has not really been seen to be out of the symbol okay so you pick the last uh calibration out there and the last calibration is a six there so that is our six millimeters okay remember the degree of accuracy of this instrument is 0 0.01 although there are some which are now advanced they're digital and their degree of accuracy has increased but for now uh within our study material we stick to this one where uh, the one that we look at so much is the one with the degree of accuracy of 0 0.01 millimeters. So we put two zeros here to simply accommodate this second reading on the micro scale. So six is our reading there, which is six millimeters, of course. Oh, look at my handwriting. Then the micro scale there is uh, you look at the scale. Some of them have got 100, go up to 100, some go up to 50, but you simply look at the calibration on the thimble scale or the micro scale that is in line with this this main line here on the main scale so this calibration is in line with this line there so and you can tell to say this is a 20 21 22 23 24 25 this is a 24 but you read this or you multiply the reading you get here by 0 0.01 okay which will give you um 0 0.24 so you don't write it as 24 you divide your reading by 100 okay so it comes out as 0 0.24 when you add the two 0 0.24 millimeters of course uh, uh metric units as you divide those two i mean as you add these two here your actual reading is coming out as zero point i mean 6.24 millimeters that's our reading right there okay next question state two precautions taken when using the instrument in order to prevent errors one of them is to oil the instrument because it involves rotation. The part, there are some parts which have to move. If there's no oil, the instrument will have friction. Friction will simply make it have or be less accurate because it will be stuck. The other precaution you should take, of course, is um, uh, you zero it. Make sure before you start your measurements, make sure the zero mark is where it's supposed to be. Okay, And that way you'd actually reduce possibility of having errors with your instrument. Question two reads, a pebble is thrown vertically upwards with the vertical, I mean, initial speed of 10 meters per second. After reaching its maximum height, it falls freely to the starting point. Take G to be 10 meters per second squared. A. On the grid below, plot a velocity time graph for the motion of the pebble. A pebble is a stone, okay? It's a, a reasonable size of a stone that can easily be thrown in a pebble. Pebbles are commonly found uh, along the rivers. They are usually, you know, smooth due to friction over many years as the water, you know, makes the stones rub against each other. So this stone is thrown up at the speed of 10 meters per second squared upwards, meaning against gravity. So they, there's a table there. So question one reads on the grid below, plot the velocity time graph for the motion of the pebble. Um... I use the black pen, but this is my graph here. That's my velocity. Always label, uh, when you're using a graph paper, always label, have the title. 
you graph should have a title and each axis should have um uh, should have um of course direction there it should have a title each axis should have um uh, a title so i mean uh, yes uh, it's mean, not really title but should be labeled this is my velocity in meters per second and this is my time here in the x in seconds so if you look at that i've scaled my 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 y axis in uh in the scale of 5 10 15 20 uh though my interest is at 10 then this one here i've given every three box represents one second here every two boxes represent five uh, meters a speed of five meters per second so the speed as you throw the pebble the moment you just let it go it is starting to move from a point where you know its initial velocity if you remember initial speed or velocity is 10 so the initial is taken to be 10 as you're just letting it go okay so we start from 10 after one second it simply this is the one second this will be the, how the graph is going to be after one second this pebble is going to reach its maximum height you are throwing it up and if it's going upwards it means gravity is pulling it downwards what goes up must come down meaning it's actually slowing down so initial velocity is 10 and the rate of change of velocity due to gravity is 10 meters per second squared meaning after one second that 10 meters will go to this this 10 meters per second will come down to zero so it would take one second for this pebble to reach its maximum height you can tell just by looking at the velocity you've been given it's a 10 and your understanding of what acceleration due to gravity is so 10 is my initial velocity after one second this stone will reach this is a zero this is the origin of the graph the velocity is going to be zero and time is going to be one second after the next second or after reaching maximum height it will temporarily stop that's why the velocity is zero it will momentarily stop then start falling down and it will take another second which makes it now two seconds to reach where it started from and it will reach the point it began from or where it was let go from at the velocity that it left with so it will take two seconds to go up to and come down to its original position. So the graph will appear something like this. It starts with high velocity, then stops when it reaches maximum height, then falls down. As it falls down, it's now falling towards or being influenced by gravity. It's now under free fall. It will be accelerating. So speed will again start increasing. That is why the graph looks like that. Okay. So question B. You can pause the video or just move it backwards and listen to my explanation if you didn't get it right. Question B, from the graph you have plotted in A, calculate the maximum height the pebble reaches. From this graph here, get some information from it and calculate the maximum height it reaches. Um, my calculation was here on the side, check it out. Uh, I took this equation here and make or made a X or velocity, I mean displacement or height um to be s some books will put x so i made s my subject and this is actually acceleration and since we're talking about acceleration due to gravity i changed my a to g so s which is our height um uh, becomes a subject and then you have your final velocity zero because it reaches maximum velocity i um, mean maximum height and momentarily stops meaning it stops then begins another journey so mark uh, any final velocity is a zero initial velocity is a 10 as we are told in the question over 2g we not say g is actually um uh, uh, a 10 as well take g to be 10 as it is given in the question here or in the in, in the parent question take g to be 10 meters per second squared so when we come down here this is a negative 10 squared which we the 10 which is the initial velocity which is this u here then this is a two times um negative 10 i say negative 10 to give us negative 20 because the acceleration is 10 meters per second squared for gravity or the effect of gravity on, on mass or the acceleration due to gravity is the 10 meters per second squared but this stone was going upwards and we're looking for its highest uh, the highest point it reaches so this acceleration is actually slowing down it's actually deceleration it is retardation meaning the stone was slowing down so the value of g becomes a negative so it becomes a 2 times negative 10 giving us negative 20 if something is going against gravity like upwards it will be slowing down because gravity will be pulling it downwards meaning it will be accelerating negatively 
so anyway at the end of it all the two negatives cancel out then this is actually a hundred over 20 giving you five meters uh, as our maximum height reached by the stone hope that is okay next question the acceleration of the pebble as it was moving up okay calculate they want us to calculate you show you i can tell by just mentioning but the acceleration they want you to calculate to the acceleration of the pebble as it was going up i know to say acceleration due to gravity was negative 10 because it was going against gravity and everything that falls due to gravity everything that falls under free fall accelerates at a rate of 10 meters per second squared because uh, of provided you ignore air resistance because that's the magnitude of the gravitational force so if the object is going upwards the acceleration would actually be negative provided its speed or its velocity is below the escape velocity okay escape velocity meaning velocity that would enable an object to escape from our atmosphere so from this, how did I find my 10 meters per second squared? I use this equation here. I did some calculations. Allow me to just bring up this paper here. So I began with this. That's my equation there. Um, I simply made sure that I narrowed out. I made G my subject. Okay. I made sure that I made this cross over to this side. It becomes S minus UT. Initial velocity time. Distance. Uh, gravity. Then time squared. So this was transposed to the other side giving us a negative there then i cross multiplied the two came this side then gt squared remained by itself in short i made g the subject of the formula learn how to do that then i did now my subtraction so at the end of it all of course this two times s then two times these two here giving us uh, uh this here so finally the two t's cancel out you have one t remaining there your algebra has to work here so look harder and you see what I was actually doing. Then finally, I use then the actual values. Then when I do my subtraction, it comes out as 10 minus 20, giving me that value over there. Okay, that value over there. So again, you may wonder, like, how did I get the time? Because from this calculation here, I have my initial velocity, which is 10, the distance, which is a 5, but time is not giving. So calculation-wise, time can be done by using this equation here the equation for acceleration where you take this equation then make t the subject from the equations of motion final velocity zero because it tops at its maximum height minus the initial velocity of acceleration due to gravity it's going upward so this is negative and this comes out as negative and the answer comes out as one proving even from our graph that it will take one second to reach its maximum height so this is the one that comes out to be the t which is this one here so the answer is negative 10 uh, uh, meters per second squared, uh, uh, which is our acceleration. And so I write my value there. So you can write the formula there, then you write your final answer here with the correct units. This is too little a space for you to do all that calculation. So do it uh, aside, but write the formula that you used and your final answer. See, uh, compare your answer in B2 to the value of G, okay? b2 which is this value here negative 10 the value of g is given to us as 10 meters per second squared which is um this one here okay one is positive and the other one is negative so they want us to compare the answer is negative because of course the answer is negative in two okay i hope i yeah in two because the stone was moving up against gravity that would be my answer you can answer it in a different way but don't change meaning Question 3, uh, figure 3.3 3 shows a bed that falls against the wall during the day. Okay, it falls against the wall during the day. These are moments, okay, uh, effects of force on objects, moments. So leg of the bed, yeah, the center of, of, of the weight of the board, the bed is concentrated along this line here, distance from the center of, 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 of weight, and then you've got the hinge there. That's our hinge, meaning this is our pivot, and that's the wall. Um, the question reads, when horizontal, the bed is supported on one side of, one side by a hinge and on the other side by two legs. The weight of the bed W acts through the center of mass, which is 0.35 meters from the hinge. That is where the weight is acting, 0.35 from the hinge. Uh, state the principle of moments. <clears throat> the principle of moments 
uh, states that clockwise and anti-clockwise moments about a pivot or fulcrum are equal for a system in equilibrium or in balance. You can use different language but don't change meaning. B. If the mass of the bed is 26 kgs, calculate the weight W. Okay, if the mass is that much, calculate the weight of the bed. Um, they're telling us it's 26 kgs. We all know to say the formula for mass. This is the formula here. Weight is equals to mg. G is always taken to be 10. So it's going to be m times g giving us two skisti newtons give the correct answers this is kg this is meters per second squared uh, therefore the compound unit is kg meter per second squared and this is what is known as a newton in this case so newton the next question is uh, determine the size of the upward force exerted on the bed by two legs when the bed is horizontal we we'll look at the bed once more before coming to calculations. We have determined that if the bed is 26 kgs, therefore its weight is 2 skisti newtons. So W is equals to 2 skisti newtons from the pivot to this distance. FD. F, which is 2 skisti newtons, times 0 0.35 meters. That is our first moment, the clockwise moment. Then they want the upward force. Therefore, the upward force being you know, exerted by the two beds when it's, when the bed, two legs, when the bed is resting. So we have this distance for this force. Then they want this force here. And we have this distance from the hinge, which is our pivot up to here. So I'll get this times that, then this times this. And this is where the principle of moments comes about. They are equal, clockwise, anti-clockwise are equal for a system that is balanced. Or well, that is in equilibrium. So 2 skisti is the weight of the bed times 3.0.35. Allow me to tilt my camera, which is uh, right there. Okay. We all know the weight of the bed, which is 2 skisti. We found it to be here. That is our clockwise moment. Then anti-clockwise moment is made up of this, but we don't want that the clockwise moment. We just want a component of it, which is the F, the upward force. This is the 3, 0 0.35 plus 0 0.3, 0. Therefore, the total distance from the pivot, which is the hinge, to where the force is acting from, perpendicular or at right angle to the arm, okay, to the extending arm. So, we have this. I add these two because I want the total distance. When I add these two, they give me the distance to be this much. When I multiply these two, it gives me 91 newton meters, newton meters. Then I divide by this, the sum of this, which is 0 0.65 meters, giving me 140 newtons. The upward force is 140 newtons. So when you work this one out completely, you find that it's going to be 0 0.65 F1. Then divide by 0 0.65 on both sides. Our answer is coming out as 140 newtons. Okay, so the figure shows an electric motor used to lift the load. That's our electric motor, and then the load is 500 newtons. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. We have it there. So, the load of weight 500 newtons is raised through a vertical height of 3.5 at a constant rate. Given that the efficiency of the electric motor is 65%, calculate the gain in gravitational potential energy of the load. Um, the load. So, GPE, gravitational potential energy, is equals to mgh, mass times gravity times height. Remember, weight, weight is equals to mg. Okay, weight is equals to mg. So this mg is actually weight. It's actually w, and we're told that the weight of this is 500 newtons. So if we have to calculate the GPE for the object, we have to look at the height it was raised times the weight, which is 500, which gives us 1750 Jews, one mark. So actually, I did it here. Uh, gravitational energy, which is sometimes given the, the symbol U, is equal to mgh. The weight is 500 times the height, giving me this value here. Don't forget the units. Number two, calculate the work output. Okay, calculate the work output. Uh, efficiency has been said to be 65%. Okay, it's 12 percent. So efficient is equals to work input over work output times 100. 
but I have the efficiency already so I'll cancel out this hundred here and as I did the small calculation on the side here um, 65% uh, is goes to work input over work output therefore this is 65% meaning per hundred meaning over hundred you divide 65 over 100 then you have this energy already which is our energy output that we calculated for when the object was raised up up to that height so when you cross multiply 0 0.65 times 1750 the answer comes in as 1137.5 joules the work input is much lesser than the work output and this is no more this is actually the way it's supposed to be because it wouldn't make sense to have a machine that takes in more work and gives you less it means it's not helping you machines are meant to make our work easy so input should be slightly less than the output and that would actually be beneficial to us so the work out i mean the work um um input is 1137.5 if you haven't understood that revise i mean rewind the video and go through it again so the next question is actually they want you to prove or show that the efficiency is 65 percent uh they're looking you up whether you want it or not you'll be able to solve this you will solve this question correctly because you if you had made a mistake you still come back it will show you at this point but otherwise efficiency would be just get the work output and the work input that you got and calculate efficiency using the formula work input over work output it could be energy input over energy output or power input over power output is the same thing but thing is we have this formula here times 100 we ignore the e and if we're told it's 65 but they want us to prove so we ignore the e so we just get what we've calculated for and finally it's coming out as 65 right there 1175.5 over 1750 joules gives you 65 per hundred okay 65 percent next question solar energy is renewable form of energy what is meant by renewable energy my answer was a source that can be replaced with more of its kind okay a source that can be replaced with more of its kind whether by man or by nature but it's it is self regenerating okay it is it could be self regenerating or you can actually replace it okay that's a renewable avoid the word that can be renewed uh, avoid the word renew or new number two give one challenge of using solar energy yes it's always there the sun will burn for a million years to come i guess but it is affected by season and weather okay season and weather sometimes you may have cloud cover meaning you'll not be able to Harvest much energy from it. Okay, question five. Give a, a clear distinction between heat and temperature. Okay, that's a good question. A clear distinction, clear boundary between heat and what is heat? What is temperature? My answer was or is heat is a form of energy that is exchanged between objects at different temperatures, while temperature is the measure of heat. Or the measure of the quantity of of, of of the quantity of heat our temperature can also be defined as the measure of the average kinetic energy possessed by particles in a substance okay but the thing is the measure of heat is what we call temperature but heat itself is a form of energy you can use any other definition but it's a form of energy that is exchanged between temperatures i mean objects at different temperatures okay the colder one will gain heat from the hotter one number b um suggest why alcohol may be preferred over mercury in a liquiding glass thermometer alcohol can withstand sub-zero temperatures thus has a much lower freezing point than mercury so it measures lower temperatures alcohol can be used to measure much lower temperatures compared to mercury the point at which mercury freezes i can't remember the actual values but alcohol freezes way below zero degrees celsius while it's mercury by the time you reach well, you're just approaching zero it would be already frozen it would be it would solidify mercury is a metal okay so that's one uh, preferred or advantage of alcohol over mercury uh, number c the temperature of an object is negative 102 degrees centigrade what is the temperature in kelvin or kelvins as they have put it remember when the celsius or centigrade scale is at zero the 
the the Kelvin scale is at 72, 73.3. It goes on and on, but at this much here, these are not equal. But the thing is, when the Celsius is at zero, the Kelvin is at 273. So when the Celsius, <clears throat> excuse me, when the Celsius is at one negative minus 102, then the Kelvin will be higher than this value by this much. So you just add. Okay, so when this is at zero, the other one will read with the higher measurement. So when it's at negative 1.02, I mean 102 or minus 102, then the Kelvin will be higher by this much because when the centigrade is zero, this one is already at this much. So understand the, the way they, they shift. When this one goes to one, this one will go to 274. When this one goes to two, this one will go to 275. When this one goes to negative 1, this one will go to 272. When this one increases by 1, this one will increase by 1. A reduction by 1, reduction by 1. But this one has gone down by uh, 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 102, minus 102. So this one also reduced by 102. And this is what this expression is all about. So our final answer is 171 degrees centigrade. Question 6. Um, the figure shows three wavelength wave fronts of red light passing through air. The wave fronts are one wavelength apart. The beam hits the glass surface as shown. Line XY shows the direction of the wave fronts. Okay, and this line XY, XY, we call those lines as rays. And we call these ones that are at right angle to the rays as wave fronts. They are both used to, you know, to, to show. Uh, wave activity or wave behavior. So this is actually a ray with an arrow showing the direction of the wave. So uh, Yes, um, shows direction of the wave fronts there the critical angle of light I uh, take the critical angle of light to be 42 degrees. Okay, so that is our, our diagram there. Remember this part here was not there Okay, it wasn't there, it's in black paint, so you may think it's part of the paper. But the thing is, complete the diagram showing the con continuous flow of the wave fronts um, in the glass. In the glass. Um, they didn't tell me to to show the angles. Remember, the angles are, are measured against the normal, which is our N. So I had to put the normal here, where the ray is falling incident on the boundary. This normal is at right angle to them interface the boundary interface or the interface boundary and so they didn't tell me to calculate for the angles here so i didn't do that but i have shown to say the angle of refraction is smaller than the angle of incidence okay and then i have shown to say the resulting wave um, lengths are sm shorter than the incident wavelengths okay wavelength reduces and the light bends towards the normal that's the principle i'm following they haven't specified whether i should show the angles yet so i didn't show any angles so i didn't do any calculations then i've shown you know the ray with the direction there then the wave fronts there so this is my black pen and i've put the normal there that would be i think i'll get the mark from my drawing there number b state what happens to the speed of to the speed and wavelength of the wave as it moves from air to glass the speed of course reduces the speed of the wave reduces due to the higher density medium entered glass has got higher density than air light reduces speed when it, when it enters a medium of higher density and it eventually can be blocked okay for example in water water is colorless because it's made up of very small molecules therefore light can pass through easily so it, it appears to be colorless, but the, when the water begins to increase in quantity, like in a swimming pool, then you begin to see filtering or filtration. You begin to see light being blocked, and eventually the sea appears uh, sometimes greenish, sometimes blue, because of light cannot easily just penetrate to make the whole body of the you know seawater look transparent. So light can be blocked. It slows down. The speed reduces. Wavelength. The wavelength reduces due to the reduction in speed. Okay. Think about that. The wavelength reduces due to the reduction of speed, but frequency remains the same. The frequency will remain the same. Uh, calculate the refractive refractive index of the glass. So I use this calculation here. Okay, this formula here where we say refractive index is equal to sine of the sine uh, of the angle of uh, refract. I mean, incident over sine of the angle of refraction. 
when the they are saying calculate uh, calculate the refractive index and they tell it they are they did tell us to say the critical angle is 42 degrees remember that the critical angle is the angle of incidence that supports an angle of refraction of 90 degrees when light is moving from uh, a more dense media to a less dense you can repeat the video on that one or let me just do it again the critical angle is the angle of incidence that supports an angle of refraction of 90 degrees magnitude so meaning our uh, our sign let me just this is my calculation here but let me just write it okay my pen not doing much sign 90 over sine 42 degrees this is how it is okay this is our angle of incidence and this is our angle of refraction i mean excuse me this is yes this is our angle of incidence and this is our angle of refraction but when you come back to this diagram here light is moving from air to glass so whenever you're calculating for the refractive index always take light to be moving from the denser medium that is how you find that the critical angle becomes smaller than the angle of refraction even if the the lines are shown to be entering always take light always take the um i mean always take the the angle of incidence to be the one on the less dense side okay so if this angle here begins to be increased this one is bigger it will reach 90 degrees before this one reaches the boundary so this one will reach the will touch the normal before this one reaches the 90 degrees so always take light to be moving from a more dense media to a less dense medium okay always even if they have given you something like this this will be our, our angle of incidence angle of refraction but when they say calculate the angle the refractive index take this angle there to be your 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 what your your, your angle of uh, incidence so as this increases in magnitude even this angle here will increase in magnitude meaning that this line will start going down okay down 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 until remember they are measured against the normal so it will be 90 degrees so this line here will reach 90 degrees quicker than this one reaching this part here the boundary and um, hence um this here the 90 degrees coming up here check from your book or re re rewind the video to understand what i've just explained so sign one which is sign 90 over sign r our sign r is 42 giving us this value here so refractive index is 1.49 at least give it to two decimal places 1.49 so our answer comes out as that d if the beam of red light is replaced with yellow light describe one change that may occur in in the completed diagram if the red light is replaced by a uh, yellow light remember light moves at the speed of light it's made up of seven wavelengths let me just say electromagnetic waves move at the speed of light so their speed will be the, will be the same but the difference between these wavelengths is usually wavelength and frequency so they want us to explain what would be different if we had used yellow light um the wavelengths before and after entering glass will be shorter because yellow um, what did, yellow yeah yellow light has a higher frequency let me just write it like this because yellow light has a higher frequency higher frequency means shorter wavelength because the waves are being emitted at a at a much faster rate so the wavelengths will be shorter so i hope you've got that one okay almost there question seven the figure shows an electric circuit containing 12 volts power supply and four resistors um yeah and that's our diagram right there so before you even answer such diagrams you should understand or you should have read or understand the circuit diagrams parallel and series connections and the effect of parallel and series connections on voltage and current okay voltage current resistance the effect of of the two types of connections on voltage resistance and current then you can easily understand what you know whatever they are trying to you know bring up here so our first question is calculate the combined resistance of the two and four <clears throat> excuse me two and four these are in series you just add them okay the combined resistance just add them the formula is this just add the total is six ohms okay the combined resistance of the three and six which are in parallel so the three and six in parallel use that formula which works only for two resistors okay so r1 times r2 over r1 plus r2 
6 times 3, 18. 6 plus 3, 9. When you divide the 2, gives you 9, I mean 2 ohms. Remember that when resistors are connected like this in parallel, their effective resistance is always smaller than the smaller one between the 2 or the 3 or all of them. So our answer comes at us too. Our answer there is a 2. Next question, determine the reading on the ammeter. Okay, determine the reading on the ammeter. The ammeter is right there, okay. So our resistance here is 2, as we have calculated the effective resistance in that circuit line is 2. Understand that this line here is parallel to this line here. And in parallel uh, circuits, the voltage is the same. So here you have 12 volts across this uh, circuit line here, this branch here. And there's 12 volts across this branch here. Remember, understand the effect of uh, parallel and serial connections on voltage, current, and resistance. So in parallel, voltage is maintained, but current is different. While it's in series, voltage is shared and current remains the same. So across this is 12 volts. 2 ohms this is a 2 coming from this so 12 volts 2 ohms from this then you can know the current there so bringing it down again here my answer comes out as in i make i my my my, my subject 12 ohms over 2 because of this formula here v is equals to ir make i the subject there for v over r which is v over r my answer is 6 amperes okay 6 amperes is the current across the ammeter and they are now asking for the potential difference V across the 4 ohm resistor. So potential difference across V, okay. Remember current is the same here, but voltage is not the same. But we know to say voltage across this whole branch here is 12 volts. But because these resistors are in series, they are sharing the 12 volts in this branch. They are sharing the 12 volts in that branch. So they are sharing the 12 volts according to their ratio of 2 to 4. Okay. So you can tell just by looking. So here there is the voltage is, is, a two, is an 8 volts. And here this is a 4 volts. Okay. 8 volts across this. They are sharing the voltage. They are sharing the 12 volts across this branch. This is 8 volts and that's 4 volts across this one. But you can still do your calculations. Either you go for the actual formula or use ratios. It's still the same. So our formula is simply V is equals to IR, okay, therefore, um, the, 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 okay, let me just come back to this. The current in the circuit, the current in that branch gave me as two amps. The current is the same when the connection is in series. So 12 volts that is across the whole branch over 6 ohms. 6 ohms is coming from the fact that you just had to add these two. You add the 2. 4 plus 2, because they're in series, gives you 6 ohms. So the resistance is 6 ohms. The voltage across this branch here, which is parallel to that, the voltage across is a 12. So you have 12 and 6 ohms. You understand? So 12 voltage is the voltage in the branch. 6 ohms is the resistance, effective resistance in the whole branch, meaning current across the two resistors is 2 amps or amperes. So voltage across the 4 will simply come from this. Since they're both sharing the current, it means the current across this is a 2 ampere. Okay, and the resistance is 4. You have current, you have resistance, you can find voltage. And this is where this formula comes in. So voltage equals to IR. I is a 2, then resistance is a 4. Voltage is 8 volts. They're sharing the 12, meaning the other 4 is across the other 2 resistor. So their ratio is 2 to 4 ratio. Therefore, yeah, you can still use ratios. All right, so I hope my previous uh, question was okay. You can simply pause the video, rewind the video until you get it right. I move on to my last question here. Uh, the figure shows the wavelength, I mean, waveform of an AC signal on the screen of a cathode ray oscilloscope, CRO. The time base is set to 10 milliseconds per, per centimeter and the gain control is set to 0.5 volts per centimeter. The gain control. So that is our, our screen right there and this is our waveform. Okay. And uh, the scale is every box is, represents one centimeter. And this scale will help us, you know, with such, you know, uh, tunings per centimeter per centimeter. The first question is, what is thermionic emission? Okay, 
I can explain it maybe slightly in different in language, but the meaning should be the same. The ejection of electrons or cathode rays from a heated cathode terminal. Okay, it has to be hot. Thermal. Ionic, you know, escape of electrons, ejection of electrons, uh, you know, has an ionic effect. So, thermionic. So, you can use any other definition, but don't change the meaning. B, determine the period of the wave form. Write the formula period is equal to time over number of cycles. Okay. Time over number of cycles. Um, we'll go back to the graph over there, the period of the wave form. I'll choose one wave. A crest and a trough makes one wave. From this point here up to that point, that is one wave. So I'll count the number of the wavelength. Okay, the wavelength. Uh or let me just say not read the wavelength but um, they're asking for the period meaning I'll not go for the wavelength I'll go for time so um, we go back to the question up there the parent question the time base is set at 10 milliseconds per centimeter and every box represents one centimeter so I'll look at the time it takes to produce one full wave okay so that I can have one wave and then time and then I'll come back to the formula. I'll need the number of waves, which is going to be 1, and the time, which is actually this here. So I've been told that 1 centimeter represents 10 milliseconds. So every box is a centimeter. So one wave will take how many milliseconds to, to do what? To, to be produced. How long will one, one, one wave be, take to be produced? So we have 1, 2, 3 four five six so from here to there you've got six boxes meaning uh, and each box is a centimeter and then they're telling us to say uh each box per centimeter the time that each centimeter represents the time that each box represents is 10 milliseconds so since the time here the time it takes for this whole wave to be produced is six centimeters therefore this is 60 milliseconds 60 milliseconds this is a 10 another 10 another 10 10 10 10 i'm counting from this beginning up to here to make one wave and there are six boxes each one of them is a six is a one centimeter meaning a total of six centimeters and then since we are told that the setting is at 10 milliseconds per centimeter it means total time this is time millisecond is time total time is going to be six times 10 milliseconds giving us uh, 60 milliseconds, but we need time to be in seconds, the SI unit. So you have to divide your final answer by 1000 because milli means divided by 1000, cent means divided by 100, okay, kilo means divided by 1000. Oh, no, 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 kilo, I've gone, I've gone the other way. That is, um, there's sub and you know. So this, these are sub sub uh, prefixes, okay? Sub prefixes, division. Kilo means multiplied by 1,000, okay? So 10 times 6, because there are 6 boxes, each one represents a 10. So 10 times 6 gives us 60 milliseconds. We divide the milliseconds to convert them to seconds, giving me 0 0.06, okay? Milli means divided by 1,000. So the actual time is 0 0.06. This is the time it takes for one full wave to be produced. Therefore, period is going to be Time taken by 1, which comes back to 0 0.06 seconds. That's our period. Number 2, uh, frequency of the wave. Frequency is the number of waves take, uh, produced in given time or in per second or in unit time. So number of waves per unit time. Now I'll pick one, the same one wave, and the time it took for that one wave to be produced was 0 0.06 seconds. Okay. Eventually, 1 over 0 0.06 gives me 16.67 Hz. This is the same as 16.67 per second, which is coming from um, this here. 1 over this gives me 16.67 Hz, which is the same as this per second. Okay. So my last question for this uh, session for the day will be this one. Calculate the peak voltage of the AC signal. You look at the setting. Okay, the voltage setting, the 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 the, the control gain. We are told that every centimeter 
represents 0.05 volts, half a volt. So we look at the displacement or the gain in the Y from the mean, which is our X axis. The highest displacement is at this point here. So you've got one, two, three, four boxes and every box represents a centimeter. So you have a maximum of four centimeters, a displacement from the mean or from the resting position of four centimeters. So we come back to this point here. Uh, 0 0.5 centimeters is represented by one box, which is every box, every centimeter represents half a volt. Therefore, x, I mean, x volts will be represented by 4 centimeters. This 4 centimeters is the total height, the peak voltage. Therefore, I mean, the, the, the maximum displacement. So, I just used a ratios here to simply cross my plan, come up with, four, with a, in an equation where I say 1 times x, then this, then our x comes out as the maximum or peak voltage is 2.0 volts. Rewind the video or pause it. Uh, uh, and then think through this if you haven't understood. Mistakes are used to control, but for now, from me to you, I say bye-bye and hope this was helpful in one or another. See you in the next video. Cheers.